Are you ready for God's word? As Pastor Shini said, I have to preach by faith because I can't see the faces. <clears throat> well, we have been learning on retaining God in our lives. You all remember? I remember Genesis, let there be light. And that was light. <laughs> Yes, we have been learning on retaining God in our lives and how important it is to understand according to John 15, 5, the very words of Jesus, for without me, you can do nothing. This is forever settled in my heart that without Christ, you and I, we can do absolutely nothing. For it is Christ and Christ alone who strengthens us, enables us to do and to live for him. Do you agree with me? Yes? You know, people of God, yes, life finds its true meaning and purpose only in our God, our Creator. You want to know your true purpose of life and meaning? You can only find in your Creator. And the purpose of God for us human beings on the face of the earth is to be transformed and to live a transformed life for the glory of God. <clears throat> Always remember, what's your purpose here on the earth? You're not put on the earth to earn, eat, sleep, enjoy, and die one day and go home. You are here to reflect His goodness to people around. One of the important truths that you and I need to do is that we exist for God. And what keeps us going strong in this world is our encounter with God, the God factor. What keeps you strong in life? What keeps us strong in life is our encounter with God. So keeping that as a base and the foundation for this morning, I have titled today's sermon as Encountering God, the Miracle of Transformation. <clears throat> Encountering God, the Miracle of Transformation. And the scripture for this morning is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, the first 11 verses, and let's quickly go through this. It's a very familiar story. We all know it, but let me read this morning. Begging for the first verse. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has yet not come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there was, there was six water pots of stone according to the manner of the purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when their stuff well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine up till now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed him. So for some people, your Bible reading is over for today. <laughs> See, I'm a good pastor. Yeah. Bible says this is the first sign that Jesus did, and we will see it through the eyes of Mary. We are going to see this through the eyes of Mary. You know, this may seem a very simple incident and story, and thus one can think, what can we learn from this story, Pastor? Please hold your heart. There is so much we can learn from this passage. Are you ready, church? Let's look into the story. The Bible says, on the third day, very important, on the third day, that's how the passage begins. You know, the historians say it was one of the relatives' wedding and Mary was there. And they had even invited Jesus and his disciples. You should know the context. When you know the context, you're able to understand the meaning of it. Mary is a relative, and so she's in the wedding, and so is disciples, and Jesus invited guests in that wedding. 
And Mary, being a relative, she is rightly concerned with the lack of wine. What would you do as a relative? Wouldn't you be concerned? Definitely you will be concerned. So Mary is naturally concerned because there is a problem here. By the way, for our knowledge, the Jewish weddings lasted for seven days. Praise God, we are not in that culture. One day only is difficult. But Jewish weddings lasted seven days. And they would really treat the bride and the groom like a king and a queen. But in the midst of their joy, something went wrong. But in the midst of their joy, something went wrong. Just three days into celebration, yes, just three days into celebration, they ran out of wine. Still four more days to go. Three days into celebration, they ran out of wine. Let me pause here for a moment. Do we also go to such moments in life? Everything is going okay and perfectly fine, then suddenly something happens and it takes away the very peace and joy out of your life. And you keep on wondering what just happened. Everything was fine, Pastor. Everything was fine, smooth sailing. Then suddenly something happened. Have you experienced such things in your life, people? In this story, they ran out of wine. But practically speaking, so when you read the Bible, you should know the context and you should also know what is the life application. How the scripture, you can apply it to your day-to-day -day situation and condition. That's how you make Bible very practical. My question is, they ran out of wine. So practically speaking, in our lives, in our marriage, our relationship, and our homes, we too sometimes run out. We too run out of love. We run out of patience, run out of thoughtfulness. We run out of trust, caring, and service. We run out sometimes in our life too. You know, what I've learned in my walk with the Lord is that one of the virtues that we need to develop as a child and as a human being is to be thoughtful in life. And I call it as a virtue, to be thoughtful in life. And by thoughtfulness, what do I mean? Yes, by thoughtfulness, I mean to think about others or you think for others and understand the opposite person's need in order to care and to serve. And this is called being sensitive. When you think on behalf of others in order to care and to serve, you are being sensitive. And this actually defeats being selfish and self-centered. What is the remedy for selfishness and self-centeredness? Be thoughtful. Be thoughtful. You know, today many relationships are falling apart. Why? Because the partners do not display and demonstrate thoughtfulness, and sensitivity in their relationship. You know, just saying, I love you, doesn't mean anything. Just saying, I love you, doesn't mean anything unless that love is demonstrated to words of care and acts of service. Initially, when you're not married, you like to hear the word, I love you. After you get married, the word, I love you, changes. What happened? Think about it. People of God, love needs to be demonstrated through actions and through care. Love needs to be demonstrated. You know, someone said this way, true love is like ghost. Everybody talks, nobody can see. It's humor, but there's a message in that humor. What happened here in this story? On the third day of the seven-day party, they ran out of wine. The culture that was prevalent in those days was a culture of honor and shame, a very important point. The culture of that time was the culture of honor and shame. And failing to provide adequately for the guest would involve social disgrace. You see, hospitality in the East was a sacred duty. And for things to literally run dry would have been a terrible shame to the bride and the groom. 
Do you know what does it mean to the family, this situation? You have hosted a party and things run out. What will happen to you? Put yourself in the place of host. And there's a shortage. And the distinguished guests are already there. What will happen to you? Embarrassment. Do you know what that means to that family? Disgrace. Disgrace. That's what it means. To invite guests and not have enough means that this family is forever disgraced and the neighbors, among the neighbors in the small town. And this would be a shame to the bride and the groom and to their families. And lifelong, they have to hear this. And in the closely knitted communities of Jesus' day, such an era would have never been forgotten. And this would haunt the newly wedded couple all their lives. So what I'm talking about this morning is embarrassment and shame. And we all go through that. Whether you confess it or no, the truth remains the same. How are you? I am fine. How fine is your fine sister and brother? Think about it. You know, and it becomes quite difficult to handle such moments of crisis in our life. You know, many people struggle with this. I'm talking about embarrassment and shame. And many people uh, struggle with this. And it comes in various forms. But the bottom line is, you're struggling with shame and embarrassment. And you can't even tell someone. How are you? I am fine. How are things? Okay. Full stop. No further questions, please. For many, their past haunts them. You know, many people get over their sin, but they don't get over the shame of their sin, which is involved, and that memory really kills them and haunts them. Have you been there, people? Or do you know somebody who struggles with it? Struggling from the guilt of things. Why did I do that? Why? How could that thing happen? And it's been years you're fighting it. You know, such people don't live productive lives. Forgive me, I am not here to discourage anyone or speak anything negativity, but I'm bringing the truth as it is. Such people don't live productive lives. Rather, they live like victims and they go around being hurt and hurting others. Please don't live a life of victim. Please, my humble request this morning to us. Moreover, know that your loving Savior has paid the price for you on the cross 2,000 years ago. So please don't live like a victim. Know that you are victor in Jesus and victorious in Jesus Christ. You belong to King Jesus. The victorious King. So hear this message today. The God who loves you loves to transform your life. And he's reaching out to you today through this message. So please keep your heart open and listen to what the Lord and his word is ministering to us today. You need to know your God to live a confident life. Knowing God brings confidence, not a wallet full of money. What brings confidence? Knowing God. You know, our God specializes in adding beauty to ashes. Our God specializes in bringing beauty to ashes. Maybe nobody has given you any chance and hope and your current situation makes you feel that you're done and dusted. But hold on, the one who called you, he is faithful. He is faithful. You know why? Because your times and your seasons are about to change for the God of transformation is at work in your life. You know why? Because the Bible declares in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 7, Isaiah 61, verse 7. I'm reading from the New Living Translation version. It says, instead of shame and dishonor, you will enjoy a double share of honor. Instead of shame and dishonor, you will enjoy a double share of honor. You will possess a double portion of prosperity in your land and everlasting joy will be yours. Everlasting joy will be yours. Come on, people, shout aloud, amen. Instead of your shame, God gives you double honor. Come on, if you want to clap, clap for the Lord. 
towards the end of the sermon, you will rejoice more. And you'll thank God that you made it today in the house of God. Because God is not going to send you back the same way you came. We see in this story a situation which is quite embarrassing. And Mary goes to Jesus and says, what did Mary say? They have no wine. My question is, this begs us a question, why did Je uh, Mary go to Jesus? Why did Mary ask Jesus to do something? Probably, Mary knew what the angel had said, that he is a special child and he has been destined for great things. She had seen Jesus growing up, that he was a different child from other people. He was very kind, loving, and very helpful. So Mary believed Jesus could fix this problem for her. But how did Jesus respond to Mary? Gospel of John chapter 2 verse 4. Jesus replied, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has yet not come. It's not my time now. You know, the word woman used there is not out of disrespect. Please don't. Can Jesus ever disrespect a woman? I want you to think. Can a loving Savior ever do that? So when Jesus said woman, it was definitely not out of disrespect. Yes. Listen to me. Neither it was also an intimate word too. It was not an intimate word also. You know, Jesus is telling, I am here to do my father's business. Jesus is now ready to do his father's business. He's ready to move into the public ministry. And that totally depends upon the timing and the word of the father and the will of the father. And Mary is talking to Jesus. And the servants are right there. You know what happens? Mary turns to the servants and says something very profound. What did Mary say? Whatever he says, do it. Whatever he says, do it. You know, people of God, one of the most profound words you will ever hear when it comes to receiving a miracle. What is that? Mary said, whatever he says to you, do it. I'll tell you people, this is a profound principle. If you want to do well in your life, whatever the Lord says, just do it. If you want a miracle blessing and breakthrough in your life, that's the principle. Just do what he says. So what we learn from this story, the first thing that we learn from the story is obedience. Obedience. And by the way, the first thing about obedience is, obedience is measurable. Obedience is measurable. Let me qualify my point as I go further. You know, Jesus said, fill the water jars and they filled the water, uh, water pots up to the brim. You know, Jesus instructed the servants to take the six stone water jars and fill them with water. By, by all means, it was not a small task, people. I want you to know. Don't read this just as a story. You should know the facts and the figures right. You know why? Because each jar could hold up to 20, 30 gallons. Can you imagine? 20, 30 gallons. So filling those six jars up to the brim, it was hard work. A lazy person would have filled half. Am I right? Because Jesus never told them how much to fill. He just said fill. A lazy person could have filled half. And the Bible says they filled it up to the brim. Do you know people how much wine they got? How much wine did they get? As much water they put in. Obedience is measurable. Yes? If they had to fill the water parts halfway, they would have had half of it. Jesus says, whatever measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Obedience is measurable. The, this principle applies even to your givings. Obedience is measurable. Let me give us a practical example. All parents will understand and agree with me. Am I right? I'm a parent too. It says, when you tell your child to study well, and when then you get the report card, you will know exactly how much and how well your child has studied. Am I right? Because many times miracles happen in the report card. Why are you smiling? I said something serious. 
because I faced this many a times in my life. Whatever they asked me in my exam, I could not understand the question. Whatever I wrote, they could not understand. So we couldn't come in harmony. And now I understand. What is the problem? Wish I knew it in my school days. You know, Zig Zagler, a great man of God, tells us a story. You know, one time a child brought home a report card with four F's and a B. Four F's and a B. And his mother said, can you please explain this son to me? And the son said, obviously, mom, I've been spending way too much time focusing on that one subject. Obedience is measurable. Same with our lives. Our obedience is very measurable. Do you know, by the way, people, that our life is a result of our obedience? Do you know this? That your life is a result of your obedience. So please don't blame others or your circumstances or the poor devil. You need to take the responsibility for your life and stop blaming others people if you are here listening to me sitting in this room if people have blamed you for their errors don't live in that guilt please forgive them and release them yes before complaining and being unsatisfied with your life ask yourself a question how is your obedience have you done what God has told you to do or what God is expecting you to do. Because remember, to obey, it's not a burdensome or a drudgery, but obedience is rather exciting. The second aspect of obedience is, it's not only just measurable, obedience is exciting. You know, the water pots were ceremonial washing pots. They did not look exciting at all. The six jars there were not exciting to look at. Nobody was excited looking at the spot. You know, the purpose of those pots or the water jars was for a ceremonial wash only. I want to ask a question to all of you in this story, what resembles your life? And I will answer that towards the end of the sermon. You know, when these pots, nobody wanted to look at. They were only meant for ceremonial wash. But when Jesus showed up, these very pots, which were once not beautiful to look upon, became party central at the end of the story. What we see, people hanging around the pots, waiting to drink from it. You know why? Because that was the doing of the Lord. That was the Lord's doing. You know, these pots that I'm talking about symbolizes dead religion. Dead religion and Jesus changes it all. In fact, Jesus brings out a miracle out of it, a true transformation. A true transformation. You know, many of our lives are like those pots. Our life symbolizes that pot, only meant for ceremonial wash. Living a religious and a monotonous life, no passion, no vision, just pulling God, just living a laid back life. Yes. Have you met such people? Very laid back in life. For them, God is there. Very laid back in life. Now whatever you tell them to do, what they say? Later. Have you met such people? If you tell them to do anything, they will say? Later. Now ultimately, this causes tension at home and in the relationship between couples. It may sound very simple to you, but this becomes a core issue in marriage and relationship. I want you to look up to the slide. Ladies, please take care. Ladies, listen. If a man says he will fix it, he will. There is no need to remind him every six months. I believe this helps the ladies. If he says he will do, he will do. Even if it's six months, leave him, he will do. This is how some men operate. Forgive me. But this is how some men operate. You know, they may be very efficient at workplace, bringing huge business to the corporate world, millions of dirhams coming in. But the same people, when they come home, they are not effective. What happened? 
You're, too, you're a problem solver in your office. And you can't even fix a small problem in your own house. What happened? You demonstrate great skill at your workplace. But then what happens when you come home? You need to be leading the way in your house, sir. What happens? You know, talking about spiritual matters. You know, for some, attending service has just become a ritual and a religious obligation and God is not a priority. They come to church and leave the same. There is no expectation to learn something new or take something back from the presence of God as they leave. There is no drive to excel. They don't try out new things and they never explore the God-given abilities in their life. They are just going to the daily grind of life, doing the same usual thing and expecting changes in life. It's not possible, people, expecting positive things to happen. Look up to your screen, please. It says, a negative mind will never give you a positive life. A negative mind will never give you a positive life. Many of them have absolutely no joy and smile in their life. Have you met such people? Absolutely no joy on their face and no smile. They are, they are very serious and they are not fun to be with. Even when they talk to their own wife, they are so rigid and friendly. Uh, tell me, what happened? Okay, I love you. Sometimes husbands are very lazy. When the wife says, I love you, husband says, Amen. <laughs> very biblical, you know. But don't do that, okay? <laughs> you know, today in our talk, in our homes, our talks revolve around work and works to be done. Am I right? At, at breakfast, we are talking what to do for lunch. At lunch, we are talking, what for dinner? At dinner table, you're discussing how to fix the children's tiffin tomorrow morning. Works. We only talk work. Right? When was the last time you asked your spouse, how are you and how are you feeling? When did you ask last? When was the last time you were really concerned about the feelings of your wife? Why is why the husband? Yes, because this matters greatly. When was the last time did you walk up to your wife and say, is there anything I need to know which I don't know, which I need to know, please tell me. And when she says, listen with faith and with an open heart. I, I don't know, your laughters are shouting like amen to me. You're smiling but it's sounding like amen to my ears this morning. You know what is missing in our homes? Do you want to know what's missing in our homes? No? You want to know what's missing in our homes? Is the joy and the fun in the family. Bring back joy and laughter in your homes and build good and lasting memories for life. You know, Jesus meant us to enjoy life and live life in abundance. You need to believe the word for what it says. Ecclesiastic chapter 5, 18 to 20. Reading from the Living Translation. The Bible says, Even so, I have noticed one thing. At least that is good. It is good for people to eat, drink, and enjoy their work under the sun during the short life God has given them and to accept the lot in life. And it is a good thing to receive wealth from God and the good health to enjoy it. Listen to me. To enjoy your work and accept your lot in life, this is indeed a gift from God. God of the Bible is talking. To enjoy your work and accept your lot in life, this is indeed a gift from the Lord. I love this verse, 20th. God keeps such people so busy enjoying life that they take no time to brood over the past. Don't you love it? God keeps you so busy in the joy of your life that can't you, you can't brood over the past. Yes? Ecclesiastic chapter 9, verse 9. It says, Live joyfully with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life, 
which he has given you under the sun all your days of vanity, for that is your portion in life and in labor which you perform under the sun. Let me read the same scripture to the living translation. Beautiful. It says, Live happily with the woman you love through all the meaningless days of life that God has given you under the sun. Ladies, are you ready? And God also says, The wife God gives you is your reward for all your earthly toil. The wife that the Lord gives you is a reward for your earthly toil. Come on, ladies, shout a good amen. Come on, you're not excited. You are the reward of God from God to your man. Men, please acknowledge this is a gift. I'll tell you, it's a wonderful truth I just spoke. You know what I understand from the scriptures? Jesus meant us to enjoy life and live in abundance. So then this begs us a question, how to make our Christian life exciting? Do you have a question? Thank you for asking. How I make my Christian life exciting? Simple. What is that? Whatever Jesus says to you, do it. Whatever Jesus says to you, do it. Yes? For we serve a creative God and you'll go from miracle to miracle. Do you know obedience is the key in your life and my life? And big door swings on small hinges. Obedience is the key. Now let's come back to the story. You know, after they had filled the water jars with water, Jesus said, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. This took faith on the behalf of the servants. Why do I say so? It took faith to take the water out from the jars and take it to the master. Why? Imagine how angry the master of the feast would be if they brought water to them. Would you do that? Draw the water and give it to your master. You'll be fired, man. Yet in faith, they obeyed the words of Jesus. Something very important. Listen, listen. Listen to me, people. To fill the jars with water needed faith. You agree with me? To fill the a jar with water needed faith. And then to draw the water and serve to the master of the feast, it required greater faith. It required greater faith. I'm coming to something very important. You might, it might not have struck you, but today you're going to learn something. Are you ready? Listen. Very interesting fact. You know, Jesus' first miracle was not raising somebody from dead or healing someone. Am I right? That was not his first miracle. Jesus' first miracle was saving a family from embarrassment. Jesus' first miracle was saving a family from embarrassment. Jesus' first miracle was simply blessing a family at wedding. And by this we understand God cares about the institution of marriage. God cares about your family. God cares about the little things in your life. He cares about your life. And I want you to know this truth that God is concerned about your concern. You know, every miracle benefits someone. It blesses children. So trust God. People, trust God and give God the opportunity to bless you. For the love of God is demonstrated on the cross for each one of us. Just a gentle reminder, people, this morning. Don't be so obsessed with your work and things here on the earth and with your life that you lose sight of God and His love and purpose for your life. I have understood this in my walk with the Lord. This is engraved right here. What is that? As you partner in building God's house, God will build your house. As you partner and cooperate to build God's house, God will build your house. The one that Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33. Jesus said, but seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. I believe some of us need to give ourselves an opportunity to let God work in our lives. You heard me right. Some of us need to give God or allow God to work in our lives. 
You have been too hard on yourself. And there are many reasons and factors for that. Maybe you have failed and messed up your life or you're currently messing up. But that doesn't change who God is because he has great plans for you. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, God says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and hope. So people, there is hope for you and your family. There's a beautiful future for you and for your family and for your marriage. So then, allow God to work in your life and through your life. And you'll be astonished at what the Lord does in and through you. You know, when Jesus said in the story, what does your concern got to do with me? It might have sound too hard too blunt. But do you know what did Jesus meant when he said, what does your concern, Mary, has to do with me? You know what was Jesus actually saying? They have not recognized me yet as to who I am. And they have not invited me to be a part of this situation. They don't know me as who I am. And they have not invited me into this situation. And this is the many reason that many times we don't receive miracles in our life. You know why? Because we have not recognized him for who he is. And we have not invited Christ into our life and situation. What do I mean by inviting Christ? It is giving him the rightful place in our lives. And making Jesus Christ the Lord of our life and our family. You know, instead what we do, we live isolated lives, trying to handle and manage a life on our own. You know, if you had in you to solve your problem, you'd be fine long back. The very fact that you're still struggling says you need help. You know, you can't fix your life on your own. You need help to be fixed. So please invite him in. Do you know God has kept spiritual caretakers over your life? Do you know that? And you know what you need to do? Take initiative and take help. Let me draw a parallel here. Doctors. Does anyone feel ashamed to talk to the doctor or before doctor? Anybody here? Do you feel ashamed to visit a doctor and tell your problem? Anybody here? Nobody. But you do feel ashamed to talk to your spiritual leader. You know, help comes to those who ask and are willing to receive it. We cannot force help on somebody. Help needs to be received and initiated. For example, when a person is sick, he doesn't wait the clinic to call him. Anybody here? When you're sick, you're expecting the hospital to call you? No, no. What you do? You pick up the phone, you reach out to the doctor. Then why for spiritual things You're waiting upon the church And your leader to call you Then why when you need a spiritual help Why don't you take the initiative And reach out to the spiritual caretaker Whom God has placed over your life If your marriage needs help If your family needs help Reach out to your spiritual leader And get the help We need to invite Jesus And let him be Lord over our lives and the way we do is very simple. Whatever he says, just do it. You know what's the problem? Many a time our pride and ego hinders us from taking help. We don't mind struggling in pain, but we will not ask help. We don't mind incurring loss, but we will not ask help. You know, you're too worried what will people say, what they will think about you. You're worried about your image. But what about the real problem that is ruining your life, your marriage and your family? You should, be, you should be more concerned what God is concerned and He's thinking about. My question this morning is, what miracle would you like to see Jesus do in your family today? And what miracle would you like to see Jesus do in your life? You know, the greatest miracle is to be saved from sins and the world needs this miracle. Maybe we did not start well, but at the cross, we start again. At the cross, we start again because gospel saves. In the closing, I'm coming to a close. You know, we saw Jesus save this family from embarrassment and shame and restore joy, dignity and honor by performing the first miracle. You know, what saved the family from this crisis and shame was the very presence of Jesus Christ. 
You know, Jesus did an extraordinary miracle, a miracle of transformation. Jesus brought out the best wine out of those ordinary jars. You know, these jars, I asked you, what in the story resembles you? I would say these jars. This jar speaks about our life. Listen to me. These jars are ordinary jars. Nobody wanted to look at those jars and they were only meant for ceremonial wash. But after the transforming miracle of Jesus, these very jars or water pots became a center of attraction and people were flooded around them, waiting to draw out the best wine out of them. You know why? And God is bringing a change in your life today. You were once rejected, but now accepted in Christ. And now God is transforming you, your life, your family and marriage. The very people who isolated you will be drawn to you and drawn to the Christ in you. And the things that are changing in your life, you know why? Because Jesus is present. We are ordinary people, but we carry the extraordinary God in the inside of us. You and I, we are like that ordinary jars. But because of Jesus and the transforming power of Jesus, He changed us. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. In the closing, God cares about you. God cares about your family. The first miracle of Jesus demonstrated His heart for families. And if you are willing to surrender our lives and trust God in our lives and give Him the first place, God can transform you and bring out the best in us. This is what I call the miracle of transformation. This is what I call the miracle of transformation. And this begins by encountering God, by inviting Him and making Him the Lord over your life, over your family, over your children, over your marriage. Watch the principle, people. Just do what Christ says. Your life will be blessed. Are you blessed, people, to what you heard today? Yes, your life is going to change. You know why? Because Jesus showed up, things changed. Please stand up with me, people. We'll sing a small chorus before I end, uh, close in prayer. Just a chorus of goodness of God. Every eye closed, hands lifted. Let's worship the Lord. And I want you to thank God that He is bringing out the best in us. His transforming power is at work in you. All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. Come on, you need to give your best. Every breath that I am We were like those jars. Our lives were like an ordinary jars, but God is bringing the best out of us. Come on, lift your voice and tell Him. Oh my life, you have been faithful. Faithful Father. Oh my life, you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am. As you run after God, His goodness will run after you. Come on, your goodness. Your goodness is running. Everyone. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Once again. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. One more time. All my life, God. All my life, you have been. Come on, one last time. To the Lord of love. No, my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able. And I will sing of 
the goodness of my God. We will sing, Lord. I will sing of the goodness of God. The God of transformation, we worship you. Lord, we want to thank you for your word this morning. I pray everyone who came here, Lord, who partook, Lord, in this, Father, bless them. And all those listening, God, through this telecast, I pray a blessing. Lord, thank you, God, for no showing up. You said, God, the first miracle you did was to save a family from embarrassment. Your heart is for families, God. I pray that you are concerned about our concerns. So this morning, I pray, God, I pray that as you transformed and you brought out the best out of those water jars, you are working in each one of us, God. And I pray the good days are ahead of us. The best days are ahead of us, God. I want to thank you, God, what you have done today. I pray that every marriage will be transformed. Every life will be transformed, God. And I pray what has not happened for years will begin to happen now. So today I pray as Chief and Church, every member, every family, Lord, even as we bow down to this word and to truth, knowing one thing, God, that just we will do what you tell us to do, God. We want to pray, God, continue to, continue to work in our lives that will be changed for your glory. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you people. Go home in the joy of the Lord. Look what the Lord has done. These jars were not beautiful to behold, but towards the end of the story, they became the center of attraction because he worked in it. So God is working in you. God bless you people.